Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for CMSMC's foundational lecture series. Today, Jessica and I are going to be going through a brief and painless overview of archaeological theory, which will take you through the salient points in archaeological theory and provide a rudimentary set of readings to help with further study. First, let us define what is archaeology. Archaeology is the study of material remains to help explain the past. And what is theory? Theory is the order in which we put facts and by way, the way by which you orient your research. Now, while there are, are, while there are a multitude of approaches to archaeology, today we will be focusing on the two biggest movements in the field, which are processualism and post-processualism. And now I'm going to hand it over to Jess to start with processionalism. So I do really hope you enjoy as we truly try to make it as close as possible. So starting with processionalism, this came into fruition in the late 1960s and 70s in an attempt to introduce scientific rigor into the practice of archaeology. So the movement coincided with the introduction of new technologies and techniques within the discipline. A lot of these things included isotopic analysis, carbon-14 dating, and the introduction of bigger, better computers that allowed for better analysis to happen and also better records to be kept. This movement, if you couldn't tell from what I've said so far, is based in science. And because of that, it is rooted in positivism. In short, positivism is, if it cannot be scientifically proven, it doesn't exist. So keeping this in mind, a good summary of what new archeology span is, also known as processionalism, is that if you use science to answer any question on the past that you had, you would get an answer that was valid as long as you were using a solid scientific method and we're collecting accurate and good amounts of data. So this included a large reassessment as to how things were done across archeology span from everything from cleaning artifacts to how we were recording them. For example, we started to take much more detailed notes on the small data we were collecting. It mainly changed how we interpret things and the main question that we look at when considering interpretation is cultural change. How was cultural change happening and why was cultural change happening? So how processualism sees cultural change is as a result of outside factors that force new processes within a cultural model, which then result in change. So for example, if you were now within a new environment that you lived in that was colder, this would then force you to produce new products that would be able to perform in the cold. It's a very practical way of thinking about how change happened in the past. The lead thinker of this ideology was Lewis Binford. And through his works, we really see how this ideology was put into practice. Binford believed in creating a system of testing and reevaluation we could get the answers that we seeked. He proposed that we look at artifacts as products of whole cultural systems composed of subsystems that functionally associated with each other. This would then provide us insight to the social, religious, and other aspects of the lives of those who created these objects. So the three subsystems that he has set out for us is that of te technology, ideology, and social organization. And these subsystems are all dependent on biological processes for change and definition and will adapt the individual to their physical and social environments. A really important text of his to consider, it's called New Perspectives in Archaeology and it is in our reading list for this lecture, which really gives you a good idea of the importance of these subsystems and an understanding of how they and economic basis of prehistoric societies functioned. He also really does get into the new technology side of things and discusses the importance of computers and archeological work, if that's of any interest to you. 
Another really important figure to mention for processualism, though I won't get into him as much, is David Clark. And he also really put this theory into practice by applying systems theory to archaeological modeling. So to give you a, su a summary of this idea of systems theory, it is that past societies are seen as a set of subsystems interacting with each other and the environment in which they are set, simply put. This, these ideologies together really created a space for middle range methods of research to be done. And middle, may, middle range methods are in short, the search for a common ground between scientific data and sociocultural phenomena. They allow for one to make observations on material remains that resulted as a conclusion of cultural dynamics. Overall, the ideas of processualism really gave the whole discipline a drive for improvement and reassessment and constantly doing so, um, and really gave a willingness to consider new interpretive models to be used within archeology. span Processualism has defined a lot of the debates that still take place today in modern scholarship and almost all of the theories that came after it because of course processualism had its downfalls and a lot of critiques were made about the theory and hence the movement towards new theories started and this is where I'll pass it on to Hope to discuss post-processualism. So as Jess mentioned, uh, the 1980s saw yet another interpretation of archaeology, and this one was in direct reaction to new archaeology. Post-processualism predominantly operated on the subjectivity of archaeological interpretation, meaning it was a direct criticism of the scientific approach that new archaeology really pushed for. It directly criticized processualism for its uncritical acceptance of positivism, its stress on functionalism and environmental adaptation, an overemphasis on stability rather than conflict, and a dehumanizing rationality. Ian Hodder, who is generally considered the father of post-processualism, wanted to analyze the distribution of artifacts and phenomena accurately, and therefore, he wrote three of the main tenets of post-processualism to be, one, that material culture is meaningfully structured, two, that the individual is of importance, and three, a close connection to history. In this way, post-processualism creates the idea that the past is an active product of the present and rejects the ideas of an objective history of the past and the general ideas of universal laws that, post that processualism tried to tap into. Famously, post-processualism is said to be like reading material culture like a text, and that interpretation begins at the trial's edge. Jess and I are going to, now that you've kind of gotten a flavor of both processualism and post-processualism, talk a little bit about the pros and the cons of the debates between processualism and post-processualism and where good things are coming and where they're not coming into play here. So first I'm gonna start um, simply by saying that losing a human factor when you're interpreting cultural remains was obviously very, very detrimental to the field in general. However, and as Jess is going to pontificate on in a minute, the reason that processualism came in so strongly with science and so strongly with wanting to have structure was because of archeology's span origins in a very colonialist, do whatever you want field of mind. Uh, that really, really was fueled by collecting. So I'm going to turn that over to you. Sorry. Yes, to kind of... <laughs> so really, really, it still goes on today, and it will take up a large part of your theory courses if you are going to be taking one. Basically, to summarize what this debate is about, and in a very simple sentence that I really think encapsulates it perfectly, is that too much science is too much, but too little science is too little. So you have two extremes and no one wants to find a middle ground. 
I agree with Hope again, losing the individual and just focusing on science is very dangerous within archaeology. But then you do have a side saying you can't just do what you want and venture away from the science of it, which I think we both agree, you can't really just go off and interpret what you want, how you want. Right. And that's what makes post-processualism particularly weak is this idea that any interpretation, regardless of what it is, is valid um, and that it has stake. And in in some cases, that idea in post-processualism is particularly dangerous. Um, it can lead to, to a, a lot of disenfranchisement and a, and a lot more colonialist rhetoric, in fact. Um, yes. And this is something that Jess and I will... Go ahead. No, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just going to say... No, you finish your thought. <laughs> um, something that Jess and I will touch on a bit later is that theory in archaeology, and I think in most fields, as you use it personally, is a hodgepodge of every possible thing that you can find to work for you. Um, and something that we'll talk about in a, in a few minutes is that what has grown out of post-processualism has been particularly field defining because it it focuses more on the materiality and on the agency of objects yeah but if we're, we're gonna get back into what the debate focuses yes on. i was just gonna further go on processualism and what it argued it also mm -hmm. really feels strongly that it's very difficult to get at what individuals in the past thoughts would have been within the archaeological record and they believe you can't really locate or prove decision making which reading that you would think it's not they both have valid points mm -hmm. but I think it's important to remember that these aren't concrete theories I think we should look at them more as methods or approaches and that there are ways to merge them, which we will get into again. Really, when it comes down to this debate is, it's beneficial to read all the papers that respond to each other. And it just really highlights the strong points and the weak points of both sides. And it helps you recognize what you might want to carry on from each of them. You can't choose a side. You need no. You, need, you cannot choose a side. You need science, but you also need to remember this isn't just molecules. Like this is products of humans and cultures, and you must recognize that component. Mm -hmm. Ab absolutely. Um, hence, why theory is so important for you to learn about. Um, so, like I said a little bit earlier, um, I think. Now we're going to move into the discussion of agency and materiality, which Jessica is going to discuss next. I'm going to leave a pause here. She said that we're going to keep it at 30, but I'm going to let her edit this part out. Give us I'll just take a little pause here. What's sad is I think we did our debate discussion better the first time. We did do our debate discussion better the first time, but also it's fine. Okay. I also hear my feedback on your side. Oh, good. Yeah, that's Great. why I thought I was speaking in a break, and then I interrupted you, and I was like, "Oh, no. <laughs> and then I you're okay because you went on a different way." I was like, "Oh no, no, no." Okay. All right, you ready? No, let me flip my page. Okay. okay. I'll count. I'll count you in. Cool. All right. Yeah. Five. Four. Three, two, one. Okay, so coming of post-processualism, we have what is called the material movement. It focuses on material culture ideas and materiality. So this movement really brought the focus onto the objects more than the individuals. And there are multiple different theories that come out of this movement. So to give you a brief description of what materiality could be understood to be is as the agency and meaning of the physical features 
that make up an object as they allow the object itself to contribute to its power and presence. What is happening is we're moving past just quantifying and counting artifacts and seeing each artifact for what it is as an individual thing, or if you want to go as far to say as individuals themselves. One of the lead scholars in this idea of materiality is Lynn Meskel. She does a lot of great work and puts it into practice in many different books, which are great reads if you're interested in this sort of thing. And she also sees materiality in her own way, which is as a set of cultural relationships. It's one's physical engagement with the world and a way of shaping culture in an embodied sense. So these are some key terms that really are used throughout the theory of materiality. And if you've caught on to it, one of the major things within it is agency. So discussing agency, again, we have a discourse of exactly how agency should be seen within archeology. span Agency started out not within the discipline itself, but within the art world by a scholar by the name of Jell his primary piece on this topic is also within our reading list for you to take a closer look at. But in short, he advocates for object agency and argues that we should focus more on what objects want and less on what they mean. And this is a phrase you will hear a lot when talking about agency. He explains an object's agency as the relationships it creates with human subjects and how it un is understood through an individual's ideas of it. Of course, Jell's stance is taking the agency and affording it more to the individuals that interact with objects rather than objects itself. Another really key definition of agency within archaeology is given to us by Hoskins, a little bit more modern of a definition, but he defines it as seen as the socio-culturally mediated capacity to act. It can be applied to objects as they embody complex intentionality and mediate social agency. So we're really moving towards trying to give objects the affordance of agency more rather than individuals. And one of the theories that really does this is actor network theory which is a very complex theory. And I'm about to try and give you a very short snippet summary so you can get some understanding of what it is. But if you see yourself needing actor network theory in your studies or it coming up a lot, I would definitely do some more deeper reading to get into the little nitty gritty aspects of it. So in summary, actor network theory examines how certain social factors come to be understood as truths. It is essentially the sociology of becoming. It was not birthed within the archeological <laughs> discipline, but it was developed by sociologists in the field of science and technological studies as a critique of the conventional social theory. But Bruno Latour really took this idea and applied it within ar the archeological discipline. He was the biggest advocate for it within scholarship in archeology. span and he talks about how nothing is neutral. No objects, no people are neutral. Everything is social and, in, and is participating within power relations with each other. These power relations and how it is affecting another individual or object is described through translations. Where the word actor theory really comes from is this idea of how objects are acting with us, not as in response to or for us, but with us, giving them a more active role in their own agency. And what really comes through in this idea of power relations and translations is that we end up describing our practices within the technologies made. And technology is not today's idea of computers and all that. Technology can just be the simple pot that was made and such. So in all, it is a method in which the past, present, and future can be combined and yet still in the process of becoming. 
I highly recommend reading a more descriptive piece on this if you're interested in it, but it's a good little snippet to give you an understanding to know just exactly what it is. Um, in this movement of materiality, moving somewhat away from the major focus on agency are also things such as object biographies. This is a big movement um, and basically it says objects have lives that need to be described from the point of their creation to their use in the past, to the context in which they were unknown to us, all the way to its point of living within a museum. And these lives matter because they are involved with their social representations and symbolizations and are recognized as containing importance and meaning in social actions over their lives. Again, the major scholars in this are Arjun Apaterai and Igor Kripkov. They give great descriptions as to what object biographies are and how you can use them. Definitely take a look at those as well. And so the final thing that we're gonna discuss today is another um, movement that comes out of post Specialism, and that's the emergence of identity archaeologies. Um, identity archaeologies are basically archaeologies that are based on the defining aspects of an, of an individual or a group of people. Um, these include, but are not limited to, feminist archaeologies, queer archaeologies, colonialist archaeologies, nationalist archaeologies, and imperialist archaeologies. Um, I think that a lot of this is self-explanatory, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Um, clearly, feminist archaeology is is looking at specific sites, specific civilizations, specific people. You know, through the through the lens of a female-oriented history, queer archaeology being doing the same through a queer lens of history. Um, in particular, there is a great article by Bruce Trigger that discusses nationalist, colonialist, and imperialist archaeology. It is in our bibliography. I highly suggest you check it out. It's very important for education in a post-colonial world and how we kind of look at separating what's currently written about archaeology and how we'd like to move forward with how we write about archaeology. In speaking about living in a post-colonialist world and network of education, indigenous ontologies are also increasingly used more as they should be when working within indigenous archaeology. Um, again, we have some great readings in our bibliography uh, that talk about um, the best ways to, you know, incorporate indigenous archaeology and incorporate the, you know, indigenous community within their own archaeology, because that's what we should be doing. Um, but again, Jess and I aren't really qualified to fully talk about that. Um, but identity archaeology is very much at the forefront of what a lot of archaeology professors and a lot of archaeology students are working with now, um, looking at things through the lenses of individuals and large groups within society and small groups of society for that matter. So I'm going to hand it over to Jess for a brief conclusion and to bring it all home. Yeah, so we hope this hasn't been too painful for any of you. and. <laughs> <laughs> helped you understand and not confused you anymore. Really, what we have done is given you the main points that were emphasized to us in our theory classes and throughout our academic journeys. It doesn't necessarily seem as the most important thing in the work that you're continuing to do, but understanding where modern theories are coming from and really going back and seeing the progress that has been made truly does give you a better understanding of where certain things are based, what certain things are based in, and really helps you pinpoint strengths and weaknesses in any of the work you're doing, your peers are doing, or the works you're reading, and really helps you move towards stronger results in the end. You can't do archaeology without archaeological theory, because then you're just out there making up conclusions and doing what you want which is not what any of us should be doing. Thinking about archeological theory, it's important to not think of these as concrete theories as you would like Newton's law. They're more approaches and they're constantly changing. Archeological theory is always developing new thoughts, new ideas, and they're always being 
Im- used and merged with other theories. And it really comes down to what theories are popping up a lot in your coursework or within your own work. And I think it's all of our jobs to stay up to date with new critiques, new theories, and learn about them as we go. Absolutely, 100%. And Jess and I will both test that in in both our undergraduate and our graduate careers, we've used a mixture of processualism, post-processualism, um, something we didn't discuss today, culture history, you know, we, we've used all of them and they're important to consider all of them. Um, you know, we, a lot of archeologists make the joke that we're the only profession that kills our informants. And that's why it's important to see what movement was prevalent when you're reading a site report, what movement was prevalent when you're considering who you're taking your information from, because that is just as important as the information that's being given to you. As in archeology, span context is everything. If you don't know the provenance of your particular site, you know nothing. And if you don't know the theory that your archeologist is using, if you can't figure it out, you also basically know nothing. So um, like we said before, there's a full bibliography available in the description. It's all of the rudimentary readings that we've discussed today, as well as some more internal reading that'll help you better to understand and other perspectives. Um, at CMSMC, we like to do these fun events. Um, Jessica is one of our editors and I am our editor in chief. So we would love you to visit us at cmsmc.org uh, to read our weekly publications and to keep up with our upcoming educational and networking events. Um, and as always, if you wanna to submit to us, if you wanna work with us, if you wanna literally do anything with us, please contact us at admin at cmsmc.org. Org. And thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you have a wonderful day and that you now have a brief and painless understanding of our archaeological theory. And do your readings. And do your readings. <laughs> we'll get you All right. That's done. All right. We're going to stop oh the recording. God. <laughs> Did it stop?